Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh wa sumullah. So welcome everyone to the new members area. Inshallah, we're going to get to work and begin with the first video in a minute. And uh, this presentation was originally recorded back in 2011 when I first disclosed the method. Because I've been teaching like this for over 10 years now. And um, in between the 10 years, people had sent comments and posted on internet forums. Like one sister in particular, she posted at the Al Maghrib forums. And she said, um, I learned more in one day than an entire year studying at Harvard. So there was comments like that where students uh, were revealing and telling us that three weeks of studies eclipsed all of their previous attempts, years of study combined. So I, I looked at what, it is, what is it exactly that makes this method so powerful, and I think I nailed it down because I released that presentation and it was watched several thousand times, and it then became the basis of a 45-page document that, um, that has now been downloaded 122,000 times. So inshallah, when we go to the video, I'll continue speaking with you there. At the end of the video, there's a mind-blowing example. And, um, and when you watch that example, you will get an appreciation and you will get a clear understanding of why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose this language for the me uh, as the medium for his final message and what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam meant when he said in a famous hadith, أُعْتِيتُ جَوَامِعَ الْكَلِمِ I was given words of great comprehensive meaning. وَاَخْتُصِرَ لِيَ الْكَلَامُ اِخْتِصَارًا And speech was made concise for me. So he's talking about his own God-given aptitude and his talent and his eloquence because he was more eloquent than everyone. But he's also talking about the language because the language has these things built into it. So all of this, inshallah, in the video. And at the end of the video, I'll also give you a link where you can download the 45-page document. And students have said that just these 45 pages cover more than an entire year's worth of university curriculum. And then in the second, third, and fourth videos, I'll tell you a little more about myself and what got me into this and how this method was developed. And more importantly, uh, I'll reveal a lot of the system itself right within these 10 days. And the system we have here is a little smart because it moves as quickly as you move. So if you watch the presentation in one day, by the next day, the next video will be unlocked for you. So right now, you have access to the first video, and the next three videos are locked. But um, as, you as you progress through the content, the videos will be unlocked, and conceivably, you can get through all of it in four days, if, if that's how quickly you want to move. So with all of that said, let's now move to the presentation, and I'll continue speaking with you there. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yusuf Mullah here. Inshallah, in this uh, series of short videos, what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw your attention to what I consider the big mistake that practically everyone studying Arabic is currently making and it's holding them back and it's really stopping them from reaching their goal and uh, it's delaying the achievement of results in, in a big way. And um, if you're able to get your head around this one big mistake and understand the proper approach, then what this will do is that it will enhance your benefits moving forward by a factor of 16. I'll say that one more time. It will enhance your benefits by 1,600%. So every hour you put in is as if you're putting in 16 hours, not knowing the proper approach. It's a bold promise, and it's huge, and inshallah, it's going to change your life. Okay, we're going to dive right in. We have a lot of ground to cover. So I would, I would suggest not to take notes. The slides will be given to you, and you can print out the slides, and you can study them. So you can ask questions about anything I'm about to mention. I'm going to stick to one core concept. It's this one concept, if you get it, it will make our job a lot easier. And in the second and third and fourth and subsequent videos, we're going to build upon what we cover in this, in, in this introductory session. So let's dive right in. Okay, the problem is that when most people approach the Arabic language, they begin with a series of textbooks. Okay, and there's many popular textbooks out there, but what's common between all the textbooks is they use one particular method, they progress from the simple to the complex. And you can probably relate to what I'm talking about, that if you open up the textbook, the first and second and third sessions would be talking about phrases, like two word, two word simple structures, and um, nominal sentences that have a subject and a predicate, and then, and then how to connect more words together to create bigger sentences. And this is how the textbooks, they move forward from the simple to the complex, which intuitively, upon first glance, it seems like the proper method. And it seems because we've been taught, we've all been taught that in order to attain any goal, um, we, don't, we shouldn't look at it as a project, but instead we should look at it as steps. So when you segment um, the achievement of a goal into steps and then, and then gradually proceed to traverse those steps, then this makes it easier to attain the goal. Okay, but what I'm here to tell you is that in the case of Arabic, this is actually a big error. When you, when you, when you approach it from the simple to the complex, what you're doing is you're severely hampering your progress. So, so this is what people are doing. They're moving from the simple to the complex. And this is true in the case of all popular textbook series. 
that I've seen and probably also you're familiar with many of those. So this is also true in the university curriculums. If you've taken any college level or university level Arabic course, you'll notice that they begin with the very simple and they gradually uh, advance to the complex. So this approach is what causes the majority of frustration and this is what I'm trying to communicate to you, that this will never work. And the reason is because it ignores the fundamental nature of the Arabic language and the fact that the Arabic language is an intricate system of conveyance of meaning. And uh, what happens when you go from the simple to the complex is that you feel overwhelmed. Okay, you feel overwhelmed and you think the language is difficult. The reason is because every rule that's introduced to you in a subsequent chapter is not really tied to a big picture and it just seems like something irrelevant and something random and, uh, and you're getting so much of it. You're getting so much of it and there's no central theme and there's no core to tie these rules to so therefore you feel overwhelmed and you think the language is difficult and you get this sense of too much memorization and the sense of too much disorganization. So all of the rules, they seem random and they seem irrelevant. And the reason is because there's an absence of a big picture up front and, the, and no one is teaching how the language works. And what I'm suggesting is that in the opening days, uh, the teacher needs to focus on how the language works and teach the student the system. And if they can understand that, uh, without too many examples, if they can understand the overall framework, then what happens is this enhances the speed of progress. And then every new detail and every new rule that's introduced, you tie it into the big picture that's given up front, and it really makes sense, and it actually uh, creates motivation because you get an aha moment, and you get an epiphany. Every time you learn something new, you know how it fits into the, great, uh, into the bigger picture. So, so without this, if you move from the simple to the complex, then what happens is you gain no momentum and you quickly lose interest. And this is why you abandon one series of textbooks and you move to the other and you move from teacher to teacher and you get no blessings. You get no barakah in your studies and you gain no traction. So the flaw, the fundamental flaw in this method that it ignores the system that I will be speaking to you in this first video, inshallah, it ignores that the Arabic language is a system for the conveyance of meaning and it's the most superior system on the planet and this is documented by scholars such as Ibn Khaldun. So this simple to complex method, what it doesn't do is it doesn't teach how the language works. And the reason I say that is because in Arabic, the majority of meanings do not come from the words. So like if you have a sentence that has five words in it, uh, the total number of meanings you will be getting will be much more than five. So the five words will individually be giving you five meanings. And on top of that, you will have another 10 or 12 or 13. The vast majority of meanings, they don't come from the words. They come from vowels and patterns and grammatical structure. And vowels and patterns and grammatical structure is this system that we're talking about. So uh, without this up front, what happens is that you don't have no big picture. And every new rule and every new detail that's introduced to you, uh, you really can't tie it to anything bigger, so that causes a sense of too much memorization and too much disorganization. And every rule, it just seems random. So, so the Arabic language is different, and the scholars, they tell us, Ibn Khaldun, he says that it has a core and it has a central theme, and it is the most sophisticated and superior system on the planet for conveyance of meaning. And the reason is because the majority of meanings, they don't come from the words. They come from the vowels. And you see, every language needs some mechanism for determining grammatical structure. And because when you have a verb and you have multiple nouns, you need to be able to tell which of the nouns is the one doing the verb and which of the nouns is the one upon whom the verb is being done. So every language has its method and its, uh, and its um, way of determining the subject from the object. Like, for example, in certain languages, they, they, they introduce extra words. So, so along with the verb and the two nouns, you would have an extra word to indicate the subject and an extra word to indicate the object. Other languages, they do it by sequence, so they don't need five words, they can convey the meaning in three, but the thing is, uh, it's very rigid, that the subject needs to be at the very front, very front, and the verb would be in the middle, and this is how English does it. So in Urdu, for example, they say, Zaid, Ne, Amr, Ko, Mara. Zaid, Hit, Amr. So the word Ne and the word Ko are extra words, and they're being used to distinguish between the subject and the object. So the word that's followed by the ne is the subject and the word that's followed by the ko is the object and now it doesn't matter which one's first. So this allows flexibility in the word order but, but the problem is that you need more than necessary words to convey the meaning. You need five. You can't convey the meaning in three words. You need a total of five words. And, and SVO is the format they use in English. So the subject's at the very front, the verb is in the middle and the object will be at the end. And this is how, achi this is how English achieves achieves this purpose of differentiating between the subject and the object is done by the word order, first, second, third. And if you change the word order, 
it alters the meaning and what was originally the object now becomes the subject and what was originally the subject becomes the object and and you really can't do it in more than one way so it's very rigid so it limits you to the amount of ways you can express the meaning so there's a problem with that too so now the system that the Arabic people the Arab people have developed Ibn Khaldun is saying that the method the Arab people have developed to determine grammatical meanings is by far the most superior method because neither does it uh, restrict the speaker to a particular sequence, you can format it in six different ways. The verb and two nouns, you can format that in six different ways. And literally any permutation or any uh, arrangement of those words would be meaningful and it would convey the same basic meaning. So this gives you benefit of being able to stress because it's possible your audience or the person you're speaking to um, already knows that the event occurred and already is aware of uh, the, who, who, the, who the event happened to or who did the event and the only confusion is on the object so what you can do is you can put the object at the front and and you can format the sentence with the object at the front and then the verb and the subject later and this would make sense and it would convey the same meaning if you were to bring the verb at the very front so there's a flex there's flexibility in the word order because it's not being done by the sequence and neither do we need extra words there's a, there's a third method which is the most superior method and inshallah this is what we're going to try to cover in these videos this system of conveyance of meaning is true both at the word level and at the meaning level. So at the word level, um, at the word level what happens is that the letters combine together and then particular vowels are added to the words and these vowels give you more meaning. So in this free video series, inshallah, we're going to expose you to this system and by the time we're done, you'll have over half the benefits you will ultimately achieve. So what this means is that if you study for three years and you gain a considerable amount of benefits throughout the three years, what I'm promising you is that in this one week I will give you half of all of those benefits so you take your one week and you take your three years minus one week and the benefits here will be equal to the benefits there which is pretty phenomenal like how is that possible how, how can you teach like how is that possible but inshallah by the time we're done with this first session it's going to become very clear to you how this is achieved not only that but it's my contention that this is the only proper way of studying Arabic so it's not only about speed but it's actually the only method that will work and if you try any other method you're very quickly going to get discouraged and you'll lose momentum and you'll drop your studies and you'll move on to the next series of textbooks and move from teacher to teacher and it just keeps happening again and again and again so if you want to gain traction in your in your studies and if you want to gain some momentum and if you want to finally finish your Arabic studies so that you can appreciate the miracle of the Quran and so that you can communicate in clear Arabic, under, easy to understand Arabic and all of those benefits and when you're standing in your prayer that you can understand the verses being recited and you can be impacted by the verses like the pre-Islamic Arab was impacted so, so it becomes the most pleasurable thing in your day so in order to get to those goals this is the only method that will take you there and that is not from simple to complex, but instead with leading with the complex. We're going to lead with the complex and the elaborate. So, so because until you're made familiar with this system, you gain no traction and you get no momentum. So in order to succeed, you have to lead with the complex. And this is upon first glance, it seems counterintuitive. And the reason I say it seems counterintuitive because it's really not counterintuitive. It's just because we're, li we're living in this over-specialized world and everything is so complicated. We don't have any bigger picture about anything really. So, so once you gain the big picture, then what happens is everything becomes effortless. And all of the details, they sort of fall in place on their own. And uh, not only that, but every detail that you learn, once you, once you have the, the big picture and you've mastered the system, then that actually motivates you to move forward because it creates um, a light bulb. And you know, a light bulb goes off and it creates this aha moment. And it happens again and again. And every time it happens, it gets you more excited. Okay, so, so, so this, uh, this, this method I'm describing to you is it, based on the 80-20 principle, which I will introduce to you in a second, inshallah. And it fully leverages the 80-20 principle, and there's no really no other uh, method that does this. And it's how the scholars learn over the centuries. Okay, and it's a feat of staggering genius on part of the medieval grammarians that they were able to do this, that they were able to look into the Arabic language and isolate from it a core and a central theme. And this is what needs to be taught first. So it needs to be taught first, and after that, then you can go into the details and give them gradually. And it, obviously, it's much more interesting because um, you know you're exposed to the aspects that make Arabic the most superior language right at the beginning, and and you don't have to wait for the payoff. So it's a front-loaded method. So there's considerable effort in the in the in the opening days, but after that, then each week becomes progressively easier, 
and the payoff increases exponentially. You get the you get the entire big picture up front, and all the new details that then are introduced, they all create epiphany moments and they motivate you to move forward. And here's the end result. The end result is you end up learning 1,600% faster. So let's look into what is it exactly that makes this so powerful. And this, is, this will be by discussing the 80-20 principle. And the reason I feel this is important is because when you understand how something works, then this is fascination. And this is what really um, guarantees that you achieve your goals. Because on the one hand, we have interest. And interest is to just want something. And fascination is to not only want it, but to know how, how it's achieved. So you're, so you're concerned about the process. So you want it, and you also want to learn how. So, so we're going to talk about the 80-20 principle. And this is something that you probably heard millions of times. But let me just uh, tell you in advance that knowing something and actually leveraging it is two different things. So please don't dismiss what I'm about to tell you, because it's really, really important. The 80-20 principle states that there's a major imbalance between inputs and outputs. And there's an imbalance between causes and effects. And there's an imbalance between effort and results. What that means is that if you put in five hours of effort, it's not necessary to that you will receive five hours of results. Okay, that rarely ever happens. Normally, when you put in a particular amount of effort, then you then you receive either very less than what you put in, results that some other person could achieve in a single hour, and it took you five to do that. So why? Because you you weren't spending your time on the most on the most productive things, and a lot of time was being wasted. So you end up achieving very less results or you achieve tremendous results, much more than you dreamed of, because you did the right things. And you focused on the aspects that had the most broad application. Uh, you focus all of your energy and your attention on the most productive things. And this is true for everything. And this principle is everywhere in life. It's in your happiness. They say 80% uh, of your happiness is coming from 20% of your friends. It's in the clothes you wear. You can go check your closet, check your drawers, and you'll notice that 20% uh, of your clothes, you'll be wearing them 80% of the time. It's in the carpets in your house that 20% um, that per, uh, of the carpets receive 80% of the wear and tear. And if you go look in office buildings, you'll notice that uh, they do this, that someone you know, figured it out and uh, decided to leverage the principle. So, so, so now they have modular carpets. Not, uh, so, so when they want to change the carpet, they don't have to change the whole carpet. They just change the section that gets them more wear and tear, the pathway. And the, and, the, and the portions where people walk more. So it's everywhere. The 80-20 principle is everywhere. It's in wealth. It's in business. Uh, like if you, if you run a business, then you'll notice that 20% uh, of your prospects will be giving you 80% of your revenue. 20% of your clients will be generating 80% of your profits. It's, it's, in, um, it's in education. It's in, uh, it's in the work you do day to day. It's just everywhere. And the Arabic language is no different. The Arabic language has a core and it has a central theme that must be taught first. What is this core? It's roughly about 20% of all the rules in the three sciences of grammar, morphology, and rhetoric. So these are the three sciences that make up classical Arabic. Grammar talks about sentence structure, and it talks about how to distinguish between the roles uh, that the nouns are playing within the sentence. So which of the nouns is the one doing the verb, and which of the nouns is the one upon whom the verb is being done. Morphology is the area of classical Arabic that talks about verbs and how consonants are grouped together and voweled using particular patterns that we'll talk about, inshallah, in this free series of videos. So, so, so the consonants are given vowels, and the vowels are giving you the tense and the voice, and how is that done, and how do you reflect the gender, the plurality, and the person of the one doing the verb, so you know if the one doing the verb is a male or a female, and you're able to um, properly connect the verb with the pronoun, and all of this is taught in a science called morphology. The third science is rhetoric. And rhetoric is the area, the most advanced area of Arabic that teaches you how to craft impactful and influential speech. So, so you assess the mindset and the mental capacity and the desires and frustrations and pain of the audience, and you speak accordingly. You craft your speech to best match the requirement of the situation. So this is rhetoric. So, so if you go through, go through all three sciences, you'll notice that there are certain rules that are more important than everything else. And there are certain rules that have the broadest application by far, and these are the fundamentals of the language that have the broadest application. You and you would expect them, and you would expect to see them in practically every sentence. So these are the aspects of the language that you would expect to encounter in practically every sentence. So here's what I'm telling you: I'm telling you that this 20% of the language that has the broadest application is not to be found at the beginning of the textbooks. 
Some of it will be here, some of it will be in the middle, and some of it will be at the end. So what you need is you need someone to take all of those aspects, the 20% of the language that has the broadest application, and isolate it, connect it together, and provide it as a system. And inshallah, this is what I'm going to attempt to do in this pre-series of videos. Okay, so, but then we're going to reapply it. We're going to take that 80-20 rule and we're going to reapply it within the 20%. So, so to get an even more dense inner core. So if you take 20% of 20, that's 4. So, so what I'm saying is that there's 4%. So if you have like a 200-page textbook, there will be 8 pages within that 200%. And these 8 pages are the pages that have the greatest value from the entire book. So, so this is true. This is true from everything. So even in the Arabic language, if you go more dense, you can get an inner core of that 20% I just talked about a, a couple of minutes ago, and that would be 4. And if you learn and master that 4, it gives you 80% of 80, in other words, 64% of benefit. This is mind-blowing. This is mind-blowing. And let me tell you that this could be done in the span of a single week. Okay, or if you want to go a little more easier than three weeks. When I teach my students, I normally expose them to this system in the first three weeks of class. So by the third week of class, they've already attained half of their benefits they will ultimately achieve. Without getting caught up in the complex math, what this means is that there is an even denser 4% of the language that if you know it, it will give you over half of all your benefits. And like I said, this is mind-blowing. This is what we're going to cover in this free series of videos, inshallah. Okay, so, so now the system that Ibn Khaldun spoke about, and he said it's the most advanced and the most superior, most sophisticated system on the planet for conveyance of meaning. So now um, this system, uh, it has a word level and it has a sentence level. So at the word level, it's about taking consonants and combining, to, uh, combining them together to create meanings. So before doing that, we're going to need to uh, run through the vowels. So first of all, there's eight, 28 uh, letters in the Arabic alphabet and they're all consonants. And uh, for the purpose of our discussion, we're assuming that everyone watching this knows the Arabic alphabet. And if you're still learning the Arabic alphabet, that's not a problem because there's many places where you can do that. And even on our website, there's a, there's a particular tutorial that's free and it's 21 lessons. You can go through it in a week and it will teach you the Arabic alphabet. But just assume we know the alphabet. And if we don't know the alphabet, then the system that I'm talking about will still inshallah benefit you because most of it's conceptual. Most of it's conceptual and the actual practice then begins after the system has been given. And um, so, the, so the alphabet is made up of all consonants and these consonants are then uh, grouped in groups of three. Okay, so we have the consonants and the vowels, they're not part of the alphabet. The vowels are sort of um, introduced on top and underneath the letters and together they give us the, the sounds of A, E, I, O, U. And um, so when, when the three consonants are grouped together, then what that does is it gives you an associated meaning. So you take a noon and a sod and a ra and take those three letters, group them together, you get the associated meaning of to help. If you take jim, lam, and sin and group those three letters together, it will give you the associated meaning of to sit down. And like this, um, 28 letters, if you combine them into groups of, groups of three, you get like millions of groups of three. Every group of three has an associated meaning. But the problem is that consonants on their own, they're not pronounceable. Okay, because when people speak, they don't speak in consonants, they speak in syllables. And a syllable is the sound that's um, produced by combining both a consonant and a vowel. So in order to pronounce those three consonants, you're going to need vowels. Okay, but here's the thing. When the vowels are added to the consonants, on the one hand, it makes it a word and therefore makes it pronounceable because before that you can't pronounce it, you can only imagine it. You can conceptualize it, but you can't pronounce it. But then the vowels are doing more. They're giving you more meaning. They're giving you the tense and the voice. So let's quickly go through the vowels. The first vowel we have is what we call a dhamma and it corresponds to an O or a U in English. And the second vowel is a fatha, and that one corresponds to an A in English. The third vowel is a kasra, and it corresponds to an E or an I in English. And these are placed above and beneath the letter. So if we have a ba that has the dhamma on it, that equals bu. And with the fatha, it equals ba. And with the kasra, it equals b. Bu, ba, and b. And the absence of vowel is sukun. Because, um, because not every consonant will be voweled. Like even in English, what happens is sometimes you have a three-lettered word, and uh, like fun, like the word fun, and the F at the front will be considered vowel because it's uh, voweled because it's followed by a U, but the N is not followed by, uh, by any vowel, so that's like the end of the syllable, we call that sukun. Sukun is the absence of vowel, or you can say it's the, it's the consonant that, um, that ends the syllable. And then there's one more symbol, which is a shadda, and a shadda is when you have a two-syllable word in English, um, and uh, the first syllable ends in the same consonant that the next syllable begins in, then what happens in English is normally they write the letter twice and they say pretty and funny. So P-R-E-T-T-Y, 
and funny f u n n y in arabic is not written twice but instead it's only written once and this particular and this uh, symbol is placed on upon it and and it means pronounce the letter twice so here's the example that i want to talk about inshallah if you look at this um, the structure on the screen um, it's pronounced istansaru istansaru it looks like a single word okay first of all i'm going to give you the translation for this structure and then we're going to dissect it and we're going to talk about where the meanings are coming from so this structure on the on, on the on the on the screen it means they sought help so it's actually a full sentence it looks like a single word but it's actually a full sentence so so clearly obviously there's multiple meanings involved so let's look at those meanings they sought help so first of all we have the initial help so where is the initial help coming from it's coming from the particularness of the three consonants in the middle the noon the sad and the ra because this is the family this is the group remember a couple of minutes ago i said that the arabic alphabet is grouped in groups of three every three consonants has an associated meaning so these three letters mean to help and this is where we're getting the help from and then the second meaning is the notion of seeking because the translation is they sought help it didn't need to be sought it could have been they helped without the seeking part of it so where is this notion of seeking coming from so it's coming from the seen and the ta at the front which are non base letters what they're doing is they're enhancing the meaning and the and the verb is becoming advanced instead of they helped it's becoming they sought help and how how am i so sure that the noon and the sad and the ra are giving us the meaning of help because if we substitute those three letters with three other letters the meaning changes everything else stays the same it becomes they sought food for example the letters of food are ta ayn and mim like the word ta'am means food so if i say istat'amu notice how it rhymes istat'amu then the translation of the structure becomes they sought food so clearly the help is coming from the particularness of the three consonants in the middle the notion of seeking is coming from the seen and the ta because if i drop those letters from the front and i say nasaru it means they helped so the seeking is clearly coming from the seen and the ta the third meaning that's contained within the structure is the past tense because the translation is they sought help and it's not they are seeking help and it's not they seek help and it's not they will seek help so where is the past coming from so the past is coming from the absence of a particular prefix at the front okay because i know this because in order to um respond accurately to the question where is the past tense coming from you would need to know the present and future tense verb which again we're going to teach you inshallah in this introductory theory so this uh, present tense verb very briefly for the purpose of our discussion it needs to begin with either a ya a ta a hamza or a noon and the hamza has a fatha so either yastan tastan astan or nastan in the absence of those four beginnings this verb in the, on the screen cannot be an imperfect verb it can't be a present tense verb it can't be a future tense verb okay um it's not a command verb either because the command verb has a particular vowel on the on the on the middle letter which is different than the one we have now istansiru if you say istansiru it means seek help when you're speaking to a group of males so so just that change in that one single vowel will will transform the verb from being a past tense verb and make it a command verb but since we don't have a kasra instead we have a fatha so this is how we know so where did the third meaning come from it came from the absence of the prefix at the front and also the fatha on the sad those two together contributed and pinpointed the translation as a past tense verb the next meaning is um is the is the active voice because what we have on the screen translates as they sought help and it could have been help was sought from them in other words the seekers are someone else and the people we're talking about are not the seekers but actually the object or the ones from whom the help was sought okay now that one would have different vowels everything else would be the same it would be ustun so the vowel at the front would be a different vowel uh, the the ta one would be a different vowel so that so the question is where did the active voice come from and the answer is it came from pure vowels so is this vowel the kasra and the hamza at the front and i and this vowel the ta one and and the and the sad one all three vowels together contributed and gave us the active voice so you might be asking yourself what is that hamza at the front doing it's not circled and neither is there's a x on top of it so what is that i e what is that so let me tell you that that is at the front that's what we call an enabling hamza what is doing is it's allowing pronunciation with the sukun because other, because apart from the hamza the first letter the seen has a sukun and you can initiate pronunciation with the sukun at least in arabic you can and in many eastern languages they don't have that so this is why you hear people they say is school instead of school they say is school or they say sa school because they have no instance of that So so that's like a an advanced secret for you if if you were wondering why people do that it's because they don't have that in their language so uh, so they have this hamza in, at the beginning and it enables the pronunciation and it's used for initiating pronunciation because otherwise you can't do it 
So at any rate, we have here, um, we have here the first meaning, the initial help coming from the noon sadra. We have the second meaning, which is the notion of seeking, and that's coming from the seen and the ta, highlighted in green. And then we have uh, the past tense, and that's coming from the absence of the letter that needed to be there for present future, and also the fatha on the sad. Both of those together contributed and gave us the past tense. And the active voice came from the pure vowels. Okay, now the next three meanings. So we're already at four. So our, uh, our fifth one, sixth one, and seventh one is to do with the pronoun. Because the translation is they. And the they here is referring to a group of males, not females, because there will be another way to do it for females. So all of that is coming from the wow. So that wow is giving us, uh, that wow is telling us that we're talking about males. And number two, that wow is indicating that it is a group of males. And number three, we're talking about them. So it's third person. It's not you sought help talking to a group of males, but instead we're talking about a group of males. So this is seven meanings on the screen. So let's go through them one by one. Number one, the initial help, and that came from the noon sadra. Number two, the notion of seeking, and that came from the scene and the ta at the front. Number three, the past tense, and that came from the absence of the prefix plus the fatha on the sad. And number four, the active voice that came from the pure vowels, because uh, there would be a different configuration of vowels to indicate passive. The fifth meaning was the masculine gender of the subject. The sixth meaning was the plurality of the subject. And the seventh meaning was the third person aspect of the subject. All three of those last meanings come, came from where? Came from the wow at the end. So what this is, this is very comprehensive because what looked like a single word is actually giving you seven meanings. Let me tell you that the majority of those meanings are not coming from the, from the word. They're coming from the pattern and they're non-word meanings. So I made a claim earlier, and I said in Arabic, the majority of meanings do not come from the words, but instead they come from vowels, and they come from patterns. So I just highlighted that for you at the word level. Inshallah, in the next video, we will talk about this happening at the sentence level. And this is the system that is the most powerful system on the planet, and this is comprehensiveness. Because what looked like a single word was actually conveying seven meanings. English tried to do it, they needed three words. They couldn't do it in what looked like a single word. They needed three words. So they said they sought help. And even that wasn't precise because the they did not differentiate between males and females. But whereas our example, the one we gave, was clearly males. Because if I wanted to talk about they group of females, I would have done it differently. Okay, so so, the, so as you see, very powerful. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ meant when he said, I was given words of great comprehensive meaning. And speech was made concise for me. So he was talking about his own aptitude and his own talent because he was more eloquent than most. But he's also talking about the language because the language has these things built into it. And, and when you know this, then, 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 you, then you end up learning more in a single day than you might have learned in a whole year. And this is one, one student that drove 22 hours from Mississippi to take her six-month intensive. She made a comment and she said, because of that, in one day of class, I learned more than I learned in an entire year studying at Harvard. So what you need, she says, what you need in a class is someone to explain to you how the language works. So, so to recap, the big mistake that almost everyone is making with regards to their Arabic studies is they start from the simple and they gradually progress to the complex without being exposed to the system and the, the big picture up front. And what I'm here to do, inshallah, in this free series of videos is I want to provide you as much of that big picture as I can. And in this, in this first session, what I did is I gave you an idea of how it happens at the word level. Okay, or more to do with the, with the approach. Okay, here we weren't teaching you much about um, the actual language, but instead we were speaking more about the approach. Because it's, it's a logic, it's a limitation, it's a constraint that's holding you back. And the amount of effort is easy, people can do that. But the belief needs to be corrected first because the logical constraint is much more difficult to fix than the physical constraint. Okay, so hopefully I was successful in doing that. And um, in the next video, we'll move forward with actual aspects of the system, uh, speaking about the parts of speech. And we'll, we'll introduce you to the heart of the Arabic language in the next video. And uh, what I'd like is if you can post a comment below and um, give me some feedback on how you found this. This will help me. And inshallah, I will be able to better develop the next piece. So I'll see you again in a couple of days. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, so now that we're done with the first video, hopefully you can see how truly the majority of meanings in Arabic, they don't come from words. But instead, they come from vowels. 
and patterns. I made the claim in the beginning and then I demonstrated it with the example where we saw what looked like a single word and was conveying seven meanings. We dissected the word and we told you where all of the meanings were coming from. Only one of them was coming from the dictionary. So this is pervasive in the entire language. It's true at the word level and it's also true at the sentence level. And inshallah in the second, third and fourth videos, I will demonstrate for you how that's true at the sentence level. So in a, in a very small amount of words, you can convey massive meaning. Okay, and this is done throughout the Qur'an. And there's inherent flexibility in the sense that the same meaning could be conveyed in hundreds if not thousands of different ways. So when the Qur'an uses the most precise structure at each and every occasion, then this is what gets noticed. And this is the miraculousness of the Qur'an. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala meant when He said in Hud, أَفَمَنْ كَانَ عَلَىٰ بَيِّنَةٍ مِّنْ رَبِّهِ وَيَتْلُوهُ شَاهِدٌ مِّنْهُ Can the rejecter of the Qur'an ever be equal to the one who is upon evidence from his Lord? And to it is attached his own internal witness. وَيَتْلُوهُ شَاهِدٌ مِّنْهُ Okay, so what's meant by this internal witness is the special use of the language within the Qur'an. So to know the dynamics of how the language works is key to being able to appreciate the miracle of the Qur'an. So if you can see how this method will work for you, and if you want to understand more and more of the messages Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has intended for you, then I would invite you to click the link below this video and join the early bird list because we will be opening up registration to the premium program in just a few days from now. So by joining the early bird list, uh, you will be able to jump ahead of the line and you'll be able to secure your spot before anyone else. Okay, currently there's over 1,000 people that are joining our mailing list to watch this free series of videos. And if you're not at that level, then that's totally cool. Because I have much more to share with you. So either way, inshallah you'll be getting a great education. And I look forward to speaking with you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.